Who am I? Now we're going to have some tributes from various friends uh, from the White Institute and from other places throughout the city. Um, I've randomized the order in which they're going to present, but I did have the current director be the first person to open up our tribute. So we'll begin with Jay Quar. Uh, just to mention to all those people who I asked to come up, we're, we're videotaping this meeting, and uh, a number of people, for instance, some of Milt's generation now live in Florida at this time of year because of days like today. So a number of them asked me if there was some way to have a copy. So we are going, we are videotaping the procedure. So even though there will take a minute or two for Jacqueline Bissette to get from the back of the room to the front of the room, um, we'll ask each of you to sit here um, and be filmed um, for the video. We're going to begin with our current director, Jay Quay. Thank you, Pat. Is, is this too loud? A little bit. Um, first off, I, I want to uh, join my wife, who um, for years has insisted that of all of my friends and colleagues at the White Institute, um, no one is as consummate a gentleman as Milt is. And specifically, uh, that, that's because He's the only person, other than my very close friends here, who consistently remembers her name and greets her by name. So she's asked me to send felicitations and, uh, and thanks for that. Um, I've resisted the temptation to write something uh, stuffy and formal, and instead uh, undoubtedly influenced in part by your supervisory presence. Um, I, I've trusted my sense, impressions, and my feelings, and uh, just wanted to share a few sensory impressions that have stayed with me over the years. Um, one is from, and, uh, but I also want to note that by my calculations, um, you're older than Babar and Tang Tan put together. Um, it, after uh, a couple of months in supervision with my first analytic case from the clinic, um, uh, I, I began to ease in more personally and informally into the supervisory work and uh, ha had noticed, uh, couldn't help but notice in the uh, previous weeks that behind Milt's chair there was a small aerosol can with a label that looked for all the world like it said bullshit. <laughs> and I finally got the courage to ask him, what is that can? And he pulled it off the shelf and turned it around a bit uh, so that I could read the label that it was bullshit repellent that <laughs> one of his patients had given him for those difficult sessions. Um, uh, I, I have many memories of Milk breaking into song, um, sometimes spontaneously, sometimes um, by design, and what particularly stands out, probably in some confabulated memory of the revolution at the Institute, um, was uh, one of our Division I graduation events uh, when Art Finer would characteristically write a very bawdy, vulgar uh, skit that was often in very bad taste, um, but had the quality of a roast. 
And I believe that it was in uh, an ensemble with Harriet Field, Tom Menneker, and Gloria Friedman that um, Milt belted out um, in Art Feiner's version of Camelot, which he titled Camelot. Um, <laughs> I, I wonder what the Earl is doing tonight. <laughs> I, I also want to take note of Milt's stunning memory. Uh, for decades now, um, I have sat in innumerable administrative meetings um, when someone will say, when were what we used to call personal analysts or education, PEA, personal and educational analysts um, changed to be called training analysts. And some women invariably say, ask me, he'll know. And of course he always does and always did. I also was very intrigued, um, uh, often sitting next to Milt or across the table at an administrative meeting with his countless notebooks in which he would take um, what looked to be verbatim notes of what everyone was saying um, and I once snuck a peek at one of the pages. To me, they looked like totally indecipherable chicken scrawls. And uh, I wondered, what, what on earth will happen to these? And, and came to assume and expect over the years that this would be like the Rosetta Stone of psychoanalysis. <laughs> um, I had a, a lot of difficulty at times um, trying to translate Milt's lyrical and uh, um, unique style of speaking, um, which I've come un over the years to understand comes from being as fluent in, I guess, French, Greek, and English, and maybe Arabic too, that I didn't know. Um, and uh, some amalgamation of uh, being able to think in, in those languages. And uh, I was commiserating with one of my institute classmates about how I wasn't really sure that I was getting everything that he was saying. And, and my classmate smiled somewhat benignly at me, um, who he had had some supervision with Milt also. And uh, he said, you don't get it. He thinks in jazz. <laughs> and, and that certainly helped me to, to listen in, in a very different mode. Um, Mill, you're, you're our link to the past. You embody our visions and, and dreams of the future. But above all, you're uh, a reminder to us to live life fully in the present. About the same which was the year I came into the Institute as a candidate. And in those days, we were over in the uh, Croydon Hotel, which was on 86th Street and Madison Avenue. And we had uh, some shabby offices upstairs, and there was a big assembly room downstairs where all the meetings were held. And when I went to the first meeting, everybody was there, all the training people, all the graduates, and all the candidates who had this long and passionate discussion. At the end, everybody <coughs> flowered down, talking, at the end of which there was a pause. And then this young man got up and made this very lucid, impassioned, interesting uh, uh, series of comments on the meeting. Well, the next meeting I went to, the same thing happened. And then by the third meeting, I realized <coughs> It was kind of like the fat lady singing in the opera. <laughs> that the meeting was not open till mid, over till Milt Safaropoulos <laughs> gave, gave the summary talks. Now, I, I never really thought that this was narcissism. It was actually 
a wonderful example of the Agora uh, and of Milt's feeling that everybody should have their say, uh, that it was an extremely gentlemanly, democratic uh, kind of process. And that's the thing that over the years stuck with me the most about Milt. We spent many years together on training committees and executive committees, and I was always amazed how Milton managed to handle and deal with uh, Earl Wittenberg's abrasiveness <laughs> and keep everything going. Uh, so that uh, it, it always seemed to me that, that his, his genuinely democratic, egalitarian respect for other people's opinions was the most remarkable thing, really, about him. Now, I, I, I have to add what I think may have been Milt's greatest contribution to the White Institute was his wife. <laughs> uh, and uh, who, uh, Doris Lawson, who, who became like Mother Courage to a whole generation. of uh, candidates at the Institute. Uh, anyhow, um, I, th I, I, wanted, I, I really was dying to end this with a, with a piece of poetry from a fellow Alexandrian of Milt's, Cavafy, a very famous poet who Milt is very interested in. So I went over everything I could find online, and it was all extremely depressing. <laughs> so, so, Spiros, are you here? Yes, sir. Spiros Orfanos, who's, who was translating, I think, on his own, uh, uh, Kavafi from the Greek, uh, I asked him to check, and he sent me a lot more stuff, which was equally depressing. <laughs> so then I tried Zorba the Greek, and that was even, that was even worse. So I decided I was going to end with a, with a Jewish tongue. <laughs> which is, you know, happy birthday, and if you've heard it once, you've heard it a hundred times. <laughs>
It was always very reassuring to see you sitting at the fellows in your customary place, two seats in from the left, <laughs> knowing that one could count on the pithy formulation that would end an endlessly reiterating debate. <laughs> we could also count on you, as Jay mentioned, to be the only one who would be able to remember date, chapter and verse, something that was decided at a meeting 30 or 40 years ago. Really not kidding, that, that did happen a lot. I remember a minute also from the many meetings of the old newsletter at Jack Schimmel's home, where we could be counted on in editing sessions to always discover the missing punctuation or other stylistic details that the rest of us had missed. I believe over the years there has also really been a scientific evening or Tuesday morning conference that Milt has missed. My strongest sense of Milt beyond all of that is his enormous loyalty for the Institute and concern. A devotion that I believe comes from a place of care and not from a place of ambition. It is staggering to realize how much the Institute owes for Milt. If one were to compute the sheer number of hours that Milt dedicated to the Institute over all these decades, um, Milt is the kind of person that makes one feel one is better for having known him. For me personally, images of the admired colleague and the wonderful friend blend together. I was early on the beneficiary of Bill's clinical acumen when his feedback regarding my performance in class included the observation that I seemed to be too quick to make causal links that were perhaps a bit of a stretch. An insight that has proved enormously valuable to me all these years. And then there have been the many cherished times of friendship, of dining, of going out together with Doris and Deep and Milt, that Nancy and I had the privilege to enjoy. Uh, many of you, as Jay mentioned, have encountered Milt's postings on the listserv, where he is a constant, generous presence, always ready to provide the name of the colleague anywhere in the United States, uh, in the world, right? And uh, always ready with a comment of praise or encouragement to a colleague's achievements. And I, I saved over the years some of the quotes, um, and I have a few here that I like to read to you. One typical one is, and as Maya Maskin used to say, happiness is no laughing matter. <laughs> Happy fourth or whatever, Milton. <coughs> then, to misread or misunderstand is human and all too frequent. To clarify and uphold the right to compassion borders on the divine. Thank you, Milt. This typo we hear in York's posting aptly brings to mind Harold Searle's expressed wondering whether he was healing souls or consoling heels. <laughs> with, with malice towards none and with compassionate feelings for all. Cheers, Milt. Uh, in his writings, Mill diverges poignantly as someone who is comfortable enough with irony, paradox and uncertainty, who arrives at insight through peripheral vision. Mill has written a lovely autobiographical essay in 1998. It's uh, the book by Rappin, Joseph Rappin, on how he became a psychotherapist. It's, it's a great book, there are interesting chapters in there. The last chapter is, of course, Z, always the last chapter, is, is Milt. It's Milt's. Uh, his essay is entitled, The Search for the Understanding of Human Beings. He begins by delineating his international origins, what he talked so eloquently about to us today. And uh, his writing is truly vintage Milt, as he describes the effect of so much change in his early life. So he writes, the ability to observe what goes on around me was fostered from an early age. I received some recognition for it mostly from adults or girls and became the object of envy and resentment among many of my male peers. Such ability ob obligated one to be, become and remain objective. As with temptation, subjectivity, the observer's part was neither to be denied nor ignored but should be a matter of vigilant awareness and constant mistrust to be reckoned and dealt with. Those who claim pure objectivity with attendant hold on the truth, not as a search, but as a permanent achievement, 
were to be questioned boldly and painstakingly and would usually be found to be highly subjective. There were some, there were some intimations of the meaning of participant observation in the process. Course code. After he traces this educational and intellectual course, and having become part of white, Milton delineates what characterizes his non-dogmatic and non-political way of being at the Institute. He writes, I did not mind, nor should I hide, my experiencing some satisfaction and some pride in being a participant in what I see as a cutting edge of psychoanalytic thinking and psychotherapeutic practice, which were enhanced by the fact that some frustration preceded my acceptance by the mainstream of psychoanalysis. I was not meant to be a follower, and I have not thought any following. My heretofore analysis, supervisees, and students have chosen their own path, ranging from interpersonal to relational to self-psychological. His ironic relationship with any dogmatic stance of psychoanalysis is characteristically expressed when he writes, it has been said that psychotherapy relies on common sense as well as on uncommon sense. To paraphrase Morris Rayfield Scone's caution about any philosophy, psychotherapy would be cruel if it did not include nonsense. It is a necessary ingredient not to be exalted and made into a virtue, but to be acknowledged and as much as possible brought into awareness of our patients or our own. He ends beautifully and characteristically writing, Our science is short, notwithstanding willful, capricious, pretentious, and pathetic debates or rebuttals about it. Our art oscillates between the inspired and the empirical, and we do need patience, since these other two may be necessary but not sufficient. Herbert Feigl said that the ability to live with an unfinished view of the world may be a sign of maturity. In exercising our impossible profession, we might minimize the risks if we remain patient enough to pursue our search for understanding human beings, let alone helping them, <coughs> while being capable of living with an unfinished view of men, generically speaking. Thank you, Bill, for dedicating so much of your long life to the Institute and to us, and for being with us all these years in modest personal selflessness and unshakable presence and loyalty. I have a little bit of music. Uh, that you are an old friend of yours from Paris. some remarks, and I hope they're not uh, stuffy and formal, <laughs> but also uh, uh, maybe in some ways not trusting myself and my own sense of things has something to do with the fact that I unfortunately never had the privilege of working with you in supervision, so that's my regret. <laughs> mm -hmm. 
in an essay considering psychoanalysis as a science and its contributions to a science of life, Dr. Zavropoulos began by laying out his plan of action. In this process, he wrote, I intend to be more critically exploratory than candidly expository, more subjectively selective than eclectically objective. <laughs> I cannot claim that same intention in speaking with you here today. If the truth be told, I'm happy enough just to get through reading it without becoming completely tongue-tied. I can say that I smile whenever I encounter one of these wonderfully pithy, linguistically complex, witty comments he makes. And I feel pretty sure I'm not alone in this. Besides everything else he is, only some of which I will try to touch on today, this is a man it was just a pleasure to have in our world. And I'm so pleased to be here with you today to celebrate his birth. Zephyropoulos is a generous scholar. In his extensive knowledge, he demonstrates a comfort with other minds and shows us how they can enrich our experience. As he addresses issues in our field, his mind wanders to something Marx said or Ricoeur. A piece of poetry, a perspective from anthropology, the words of a philosopher, but as much as he appreciates certain turns of phrase, certain wise perspectives, his mind also actively resists being captured by any particular way of thinking. Nor is he a person who lives in his head. He lives here on earth. He invests in the notion of life, of change. As he would put it, he's concerned about the continuity of life or lives, about vicissitudes and vagaries, about destruction and decay, about obsession and obsolescence, with the main task being the way in which one manages to live through all these things, through all these changes, which he has obviously done admirably. His interest in ideas and his fundamental humanity is regularly tempered by a common sense pragmatic directness evident in his thinking about analytic issues. A pragmatic directness that is in part carrying his personal observations on what is involved in being alive. Within the context of the field shifting from viewing obsessionalism as evidence of internally arising anal sadistic conflicts to a fuller appreciation of the cultural interpersonal issues involved, Zephyropoulos takes up what was then a criticism that recognizing in the history of an obsessional patient the toxic impact of his manipulative parents is sentimental on the part of the therapist. Zephyropoulos counters that seeing the impact of manipulative parents is not sentimental unless the analyst makes a fetish out of it or sees this feature as ultimate explanation or justification. The issue of interest, he explains, is rather why what was a necessity becomes a habit in the present and purports to be a virtue for the future, the issue of change. The obsessional seems to be incapable of learning. For Zaporopoulos, for Zaporopoulos, the result of an early life characterized by having to know before he has an opportunity to learn. Never managing to feel free from anxiety regarding the pre precious right to be wrong. Milt's thinking remains fluid. He's continually interested, alert to what is being missed, particularly when knowledge itself, what happens to us when we think we know, dulls our openness to experience. One of his areas of interest has been the ways in which multicultural issues may affect clinical practice. Coming from a different culture himself, he has warned against the ease with which we criticize the flawed universalism of Freudian imagery and symbolism, while remaining unaware that cultural specifics picked up through learning, imitation, often taken in without conscious awareness, are inherent in the American engagement and practice of psychoanalysis as much as in Freud's. He is also warned against blind loyalty to knowledge that comes from outside the clinical encounter to know something of the generic aspects making up a particular culture cannot be presumed to accurately inform us of how our particular patient engages his or her culture. Knowledge of the meaning of a patient's cultural background must be only presumed, then critically examined and gradually understood within the idiosyncratic specifics of the clinical encounter. 
And then there is his wonderful playfulness, which so many of you have mentioned today, a model for all of us. We often find it in his writing. He begins a discussion. Having been invited to participate in a project concerned with the accountability, responsibility, or anything else I might discern in Sir Gawain and the Green Knight, I found myself wondering how impious or impish my first reaction was, since what kept running through my mind was the expression, if one asks foolish questions, one gets foolish answers. <laughs> I guess we could think that Milt is lucky to have lived so long and so well, but I think actually we have all been the lucky ones. I know he has touched so many lives. Stephen would attest to that if he could have been here today. Somehow I think Milt understood that Stephen both needed somebody to appreciate his mind, but he also really needed a good father. Milt has been the steadying force through many tumultuous years at the White Institute. The one senior faculty member sure to show up at a younger colleague's art opening. I'm sure you could all add your memories here. In closing, I want to share with you some thoughts he has offered us on life. The cumulative aspects of experience as the years pile up in one's life are not in themselves of remarkable import, lest they result in rote or worse in self-righteousness. The qualitative elements of experience as an active participant in what happens, as well as as a passive recipient of what happens without one's having willed it, while reserving the right and responsibility to deal with it as one best can, are of more pertinent concern. They mediate openness and facilitate change. Therein may also lie some potential transition from wish to belief to knowledge to wisdom. Happy birthday.
have this fat in uh, of uh, Parisian uh, the way you you carry yourself, the way you dress, the way you talk. It's always, in spite of everything, there is a slight French accent to the way you say it. <laughs> French philosophy. Anyway, I am very happy to be with you today here. It's a, it's a great occasion. I have, I have enjoyed every moment of and your recollections, your extraordinary, memorable, institutional memory. And everybody, everybody says, well, ask me, we will tell you. Whatever it is, I have to do with the Institute. You are our living memory. Thank you very much, and happy birthday. Milt, I, I met Milt for the first time during my first interview for the White Institute. And I must say, I remember alarmingly less about the content of that interview than you remember about the content of your interviews for the candidacy. <laughs> but, but you were younger than I when you made the film. <laughs> what, what I do remember, several things about the interview and then subsequently about our work together when you were my first supervisor. One is, I didn't, as Jay Quower pointed out, always understand everything you said. But I did let it wash over me for the wonderful jazz that it was. And as things unfolded, I found myself learning a tremendous amount about my patient in a quiet and gentle way about myself, about the humanity of a psychoanalyst, and ultimately about the exuberance of life. And for that, I thank you. And for that, I think of you all the time and wish you a wonderful, wonderful birthday. Thank you. You got it. Yeah. Uh, I think I'm here because I'm one of the few people that can correctly pronounce the Piadi Zafiropoulos. <laughs> and uh, I know we're pressed for time, so uh, uh, there are a couple of things that I, I just want to uh, mention. that um, uh, I've never had the privilege of studying or being in supervision or analyzed by uh, the Piadis, but I've had the privilege of being friends with the Piadis. I've had the privilege of listening to music with Muthiadis, and that, there's a certain intimacy to that that uh, for, for us is uh, very important. Uh, one of the great moments of my experience in Greece was being with Miltiades at Delphi, and it was a very hot June month, and Miltiades was uh, feeling tired, this was a few years ago, and you were feeling tired, and you asked me to take you down from Delphi. And as we walked down from Delphi, he stopped at one point, uh, standing on some very sacred stones, near some broken statues, and he started to tell me the dream he had the night before. And what, afterwards, when I went back and I told my wife, Sophia, and my daughter, Lina, that Nudiadis, who they knew very well, had told me this dream. They said, well, what was the dream? And I couldn't remember what the dream was. It was as if I had blocked the dream. But what I remember so powerfully was the vitality that Nudiadis had as he was telling me the dream. The feelings that he had as he was telling me the dream. This amongst a very sacred uh, space. So that vitality, I think is, and I think all of you have spoken about it, is characteristic of uh, the Addis. Uh, the other thing that I would like to mention 
and this is a takeoff a little bit of what Ed was saying about the Greek poet Kavafi, uh, who, uh, of course, you read him in Greek, but you think Jewish. <laughs> <laughs> So, uh, Ed will have a certain spin on these poems. Uh, I would like to just quote one very quickly in Greek, Nane makris odromosu, may your road be very long. And I would also like to quote something from Zorba, Zorbas really, uh, and that is that men like you should live a thousand years. <laughs> See why I saved him for last. <laughs> um, you know, on, on a day where it's 24 degrees and there's a blizzard outside, I didn't turn the fans on because I just thought it'll never get as warm in here as it does every other day. But your warmth, the warmth in this room, um, is really so contagious. Um, anyone who lives to be 100 gets to be celebrated. But I think this is a true celebration from the heart, not about the number, but about the quality of life that Mill has brought to all of us as a teacher, a supervisor, an analyst, a friend, a colleague, somebody who got to sit near him occasionally. It's quite an honor. We all feel that way in some degree, and we're all here to celebrate that with you today and that you're 100 years old. His birthday cake, um, as, as you Please participate in the birthday cake.